work for a company called GitHub. I'm just going to jump right in. I work for a company called GitHub. If you haven't heard of it, congratulations. Um, you should definitely sign up for an account today if you're interested in doing open source. Uh, so definitely check that out. Um, I've been at GitHub for roughly two years. Sorry, a little over two years. And I'm a developer advocate at GitHub. Uh, I like to joke that I'm a Beyonce advocate. Um, and it's because I like to mention Beyonce. If you cannot see those little slides in the on the left, then, uh, well, I guess you didn't see it coming. But uh, this is my social. This is what I look like on the internet. Uh, this is what I look like in chat as well. And yeah, that's my full name, Brian Douglas. I go by B-Duggy almost everywhere and B-Duggy on Twitter because there's a um, a dad who likes to play video games who is B-Duggy on Twitter. So um, feel free to give him a follow if you would like. He's he's very friendly and he does a really good job of sending his my tweets on my way. Excellent. Yes. And this will be open to all skill levels too. Like I'm going to I'm going to talk a lot of high level. I'll show you some stuff. And then hopefully you'll be able to interact with the, the repo as well. All, the only prerequisite, which I didn't mention, was a GitHub account. That's the only thing that you need. So if you had, do not have a GitHub account, it will be challenging to uh, to access the repo if you don't have it. Um, I call myself a Beyonce advocate because I joke that I'm Queen B. Uh, GitHub is 50 million developers worldwide who use the product. And as a developer advocate, I get to advocate for those developers. So these are developers that have come from all different types of walks of life. Uh, and I'm also, uh, I used to be a newbie as well, uh, roughly eight years ago. So I, I started coding thanks to uh, a boot, which is now a boot camp. At the time, it wasn't even a boot camp. It was just an idea uh, where I was learned how to code online and used to do sales prior. But the constant question I asked for myself is, what would Bay do? And it's because uh, Beyonce goes to bat for the hive. There is a, a GIF that would have played if I had this full screen. But that's the joke, go to bat for the hive. And the way I go to bat the hive is actually educating people around things that, like other features in GitHub that you can leverage, is, which is, is all going to tie into open source and, and GitHub as well. Um, GitHub, in the past year and a half, uh, they've been working a lot on these things that we call internally GitHub primitives. We don't really have this anywhere outside or in the marketing pages. But in a lot of the engineering all hands and the conversations, we talk about GitHub primitives. And primitives are things like the API, the authentication layer, uh, webhooks. Now, these are all pieces that you might not be aware of. Like, like if you don't know what API is, I, I highly recommend like do a quick Wikipedia, Wikipedia searches. Um, but these are ways for you to interact with the GitHub product. So if you want to build on top of that or build improvements to the platform that solve your issues, um, so perhaps there's a missing feature of connecting different people across the globe that we aren't really um, we aren't really noticing. Highly recommend uh, check out some of these things that I'm, I'm going to talk about soon. But those primitives come together and they build these things like what I'm going to call is workflow automation. So automation for things like this. You have a task that you do, so you work in a team or maybe you don't work in a team. Like the first thing that I do every time I open up a pull request. It, when I'm on my team is I go directly to Slack and I paste that pull request directly into the Slack channel. And uh, I wait for someone to respond or review my code. And what happens is Tuesday comes along because it's, oh, I guess today's Tuesday. So then Wednesday comes along and then no one actually reviews my pull request. And then Thursday comes along and then no one reviews my pull request. And then Friday comes along and I just give up because it's Friday and I, want, I don't want to have to uh, squash bugs on the weekend. So with that being said, uh, I'll go into how we solve that problem uh, in a moment. But I also want to talk about uh, something I like talking about, which we don't have right now, which is basketball. Uh, I guess it would have been over. Yeah, it would have been over around now, or is it the beginning of June or end of May? Anyway, we didn't have a we didn't have a full basketball season for for reasons. But if you are familiar with basketball, basketball is a sport. It's sort of like soccer, but instead of kicking the ball outside, you bounce a ball or you dribble a ball inside on a wooden court. Um, and this is exactly what a, a court sort of looks like. Uh, and there's this idea of like full court layups where uh, there was, when I was younger, uh, a kid, there was this player called Allen Iverson and he played for the 76ers and he was very popular for his full court layups, meaning that he was, though you have a team of five, he was the individual that would take the ball from one end of the court to the other end of the court and make a score point without passing, uh, which is not always okay. Like it's uh, like, depending on how bad or good your team is, like it could be, pretty sad to see someone always shoot the ball and never give anybody else a chance. But, you know, it worked for him. I, I mentioned that because full court layups is a thing that 
works sometimes, but also it hardly ever works uh, because you're going to have, you're going to be defending against five other people. Um, I read a book, which is called Hooponomics. Uh, it's, it's, um, sorry, I read a book, which is, it was, uh, actually I, read it, I forgot the title. It's like literally sitting over there, but uh, the term that they, they coined inside the book is called Hooponomics. And it's very similar to the thing that we also think of as Moneyball. So Moneyball, there was a movie and a book that came out. Um, the movie starred Brad Pitt and they leverage um, statistics in baseball to identify who are the best players that we're going to get on base. Because if you can, if you can get on base, then you're going to eventually get people enough people on base that they're going to score runs. Now they take that, they took the same concept of basketball and they found out that no matter where you shoot on the, on the, on the court, there's this one spot, which is called area 31. So if you just run directly to that spot and shoot from there, you have a 31% chance of it going in. Uh, the reason is because most players are actually right-handed. So it's, it's actually a little more difficult to defend in that corner. Also that distance is actually the perfect distance for you to actually shoot and roll it off your fingertips and get a swish uh, and like actually practice the angle. It's a, it's just a, it's just a spot where, spot where most people will just run to and, uh, uh, usually, or you run to and defend at that lo the location. And this was like more of a phenomenon towards the end of the last decade. Um, I know we're at the end of this decade, but the decade prior, prior is when they started really discovering this. And even in the last five years, it sort of blew up with the Golden State Warriors, which is um, the basketball team that I'm local to. I also didn't mention I'm based in the Bay Area here in uh, California, so next to San Francisco. And uh, so basketball was a big, th a big, big deal in the last five years up until the last season. So what I want to talk about is things like workflow automation and automation and your um, approach to your development workflow. And like, this sounds like it's going to be super high, like super like in the weeds and Kubernetes, like there is a Docker longer session that's happening. Um, actually, it must be starting right now. But uh, like, that's not this. This is going to be like, you, you sort of point in like update YAML files, and it's going to be some higher cons, like higher level stuff. But what I was getting at is the the automation and the things like area 31 type of automation, which is don't do the hard things over and over again, figure a way out to make those ways easier. So in this instance, the first person takes the ball in, they pass it to number two, number two actually shoots the ball in. And keep in mind, there's other three people they can also pass to just to make sure that you get that the ball to the, the shooting guard, which is gonna be number two. Apologies, like I, I usually do a better job of explaining um, basketball and stuff like that, but, um, I, I, I like to assume that uh, every issue is someone's first issue. That's a quote from Stan Lee, who's the, uh, one of the creators of Marvel comics, uh, who passed away last year, um, or the year before. And, uh, so if anybody's confused by anything I said, please, uh, please just let me know. And, uh, I can, I can re-explain it. I'd love to, I'd love to have an opportunity to interact with you and, uh, sort of explain that, but I explained all that and I explained basketball for, for reasons. Uh, but I explain that because things like the the automation that we're going to be doing is instead of you taking your pull request and then adding it to Slack every time you have like a new uh, PR to look at, into, like instead build some automation so that way every time a pull request is open, the automation actually opens up a a, a message in Slack letting the letting your team know that the issue still needs to be reviewed. So. If everybody, if that all makes sense and I'm cool to move forward uh, and we can jump into the repo, just give me a thumbs up or an emoji in the chat. That'd be super helpful. Excellent. GTG. Cool. All right. So as I said, this is workshop time. It's going to be hopefully hands-on. I'm going to take a lot of breaths. I know I, I said a lot of words. So what's going to happen is I'm going to show some stuff. I'm going to have you read on your computer um, and also have it on my screen as well. And then from there, um, while we have some breaks as like normally what would happen is we would do this in a session. I did post this link in the chat earlier, but what I'm gonna do is post it one more time because I see quite a few different people actually jumped in since I started. So this this link is gonna be the, the org uh, slash the repo that we're gonna be working in. Um, so please take some time to navigate there and then I'm just going to ask for another emoji or like a thumbs up just to let you know that some people have arrived to here. Actually, you should be, the link will take you to this repo. And I'm going to take a breath.
apologies too. My I don't know I don't know if you could actually hear my daughter crying in the background. Um, we are doing homeschooling today. Uh, my wife is actually, and uh, we only have two more weeks of school left. All right. I guess what I'm not talking, I'll just hit the hit the good old mute button as well. All right, excellent. So we are all here um, at this. Ex all right, cool, good to hear. Um, also, she'll be okay. <laughs> uh, we have this uh, this repo. <laughs> this is true. I uh, I've definitely perfected the uh, sleeping through crying thing, um, which is also scary but also a good thing. Uh, depends on what day it is or where you are, but uh, I uh, definitely have learned to sleep through that stuff. Um, Cool. Looks like actually some people already jumping in. So this re uh, this repo is intentionally everything that's written in the README as well as the other files will guide you to. So this this project you could actually go through self paced if you wanted to. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take breaths and talk through, and then in the in between of me taking breaths and talking or from talking, uh, feel free to ask questions. If there's anything I can get in details, I've been working with GitHub Actions and GitHub for like I said two years. So I don't cover all the content that I could probably give to you. So please show me a repo, show me your projects. I can talk through. Uh, if we want, we can take a sidetrack and build an action together. Uh, for the most part, we're going to be touring actions. And if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll walk through how I approach building an action as well. Excellent. So first step is I need everybody who would like to participate. There's no pressure. Like you also just watch and listen and take notes. Um, You'll need to go to this issue, which I'm going to assume some people have already done it. Yep, looks like six people, seven people have done it so far. Um, you just want to type the word invite and then me. Uh, you could also invite. Actually, I won't talk about that, but just go ahead and invite me, and then we'll talk about how this works in a sec. So we'll I'll watch your faces jo join in. So yeah, so EJ, Glitch Girl, thank you very much. Ready, set, Joe. All right. Joel Per Galil. It's funny that um, so at GitHub, uh, the thing is, if you ever want to work at GitHub or if you want to apply, let me know. Feel free to hit me up in the DMs. Um, but we use our handles for everything. So in Slack, I'm B Dougie. On GitHub, I'm B Dougie. Uh, to get paid, I'm B Dougie. So your handle is everything at GitHub. So it's funny to see the difference of handles because. If you if you help somebody like if if I talk to you like the first thing I'm gonna say if you start the interview process is think about the handle you want to have for life because once you have that handle you have it's gonna break forever if you want to change it so uh, yeah I always coach people all the time um, yeah, as part of the interview process but um, I say that because there's so many handles that like I'm not sure how to say out loud and that's just like the life of GitHub you never know how to say their name because we're we're a distributed company so we are 80 percent remote as of today. So meaning that despite that the fact that I live in the Bay Area and only 15 minutes ride to the office right now, the majority of the company is not in the office. Oh yeah, so sorry, the note too as well. Uh, you're gonna get blasted by notifications. So you wanna go ahead and hit that unsubscribe button right here. Uh, this is mentioned in the readme, but you could possibly just jump directly past that. So please unsubscribe because your notifications are gonna be obliterated if you don't. Yeah, good call out. <laughs> yes, if you use the GitHub app, you probably see all the notifications that stream in through all, all of our friends. So it looks like we have 29 participants and roughly 51 in the room right now. And the next step that I'm going to basically ask for is, does anybody want to try to guess how this works? My apologies. I should have... Usually I just say read the readme and then hopefully people catch the unsubscribe thing. Did I be sure that that is six or seconds? Actually, did I put that note to unsubscribe? No, I didn't. Actually, I don't think I even said that in there. My bad. Well, now you get to, you get to try out the new GitHub's uh, notification feature as well, which is this. So if you aren't aware... We made a we made a, a big overhaul to notifications where you could actually filter by participating, which you now technically I created the issue. So if you commented, you will 
what to read me. Oh, cool. Uh, I'll answer that in a sec. But yeah, uh, because I created the issue, I'm not participating. I'm actually the created person. Um, so let me take a step back. Oh, you're just joking? Okay. I was going to explain what a readme is, but um, a, for, well, you mentioned it. So a readme is basically going to be the entry, sort of like the front door of most GitHub projects. And this is how GitHub basically approaches uh, open source and uh, co code collaboration. It also has a lot of awesome stuff. Cool. And that's an image. All right. All right. So we have enough people in there. The next step, and we're going to, I just thought, I actually didn't test. So we did the part zero, uh, which I invited everybody to the org. Uh, what I want to do while I'm talking, if you haven't done it yet, if you add yourself to the attendee.txt, uh, I want to see, mainly this is, this is mainly for my own personal enjoyment. Uh, we're going to have some merge conflicts and collisions for everybody doing this, but feel free to do that. And then I'll talk through some of those PRs that are getting open uh, for that. Uh, for now, I want to talk about how I'm inviting everybody to um, to this repo, uh, which is a very clever way if you do any sort of um, content or collaboration uh, with like a team. Like when you start at GitHub, the first thing you do is you all get in your onboarding class and you all join the same repo. And then we have a bot that actually invites you to the repo. So I, this, this um, action was actually inspired by that bot because that bot was actually running on a server and I made it with a... Um, with an action, which looks like this. So if you didn't catch that, I went to the .github folder. The .github folder is sort of like the, um, it's a sort of hidden secret sauce of GitHub and how you sort of enable a bunch of hidden features in GitHub. Uh, I don't have time to sort of go into all those features, um, but I will, I guess I, I will talk about a couple of them as we go to the content, because I do bring up one of them at least. Cool, so the .github folder, has another folder called workflows. This is where all your actions will live uh, inside of this workflow folder. And I have one that's called invite.yaml. So that's what that is. And this is what it looks like. So all of all of actions are built on top of, uh, sorry, all of actions you interface with YAML. So, and we'll go into more detail in part one, but I'm actually flagging, I'm looking for an event called issue comment. So every time an issue is commented, now I'm not limiting it to just one issue. I'm lim I'm actually, this is working for all issues. So if anybody wants to open up an issue and test this, feel free, this project is open source. And then if you created the types that I'm looking for of that of those workflows is created or edited. So if you create an issue, or sorry, if you create an issue comment, it will then invite you, uh, it, but you have to do dot invite, which I'll show you how that works in a sec. And then if you edit it, because I've noticed well, when giving this uh, workshop, people will forget to uh, like they'll spell something wrong or spell invite wrong. So I want to give them an opportunity to edit that, but not have to create a whole nother comment. Um, just knowing debugging and having no tests that run against this, I just sort of preemptively did that. Uh, I'm naming this invite co contributor, which I'll, I'll call out in a second. Uh, all actions run on jobs. So you can have 20 concurrent jobs running on one repo. So if I want to have 20 different actions running at the same time, I could. Uh, but 20 is the limit. Uh, if you have like a paid tier in the documentation, I think the first paid tier, which is your team, you get like 40 and then like 80. And I think call a salesperson, I think after that, I think it's what it says. I have no idea. Uh, I don't pay for GitHub. Um, I probably shouldn't say that out loud because you should pay for GitHub if you need it. Anyway, uh, I'm also using a third party action, which I'll get into in a sec. So let me just punt on that. And then what I really wanted to call out um, sounds like my kids are really fighting right now. Um, hopefully everything's okay. Uh, um, I'm actually calling the action directly in the code I've written into this actions folder, or this action folder, which the way it works is that it's looking in the root. Uh, if you aren't familiar with how, how um, this file lookup looks like, uh, and particularly this is bash that sort of powers this as well. And the reason, well, sorry, I'm like sort of like stumbling through because I'm like explaining too much up front, but I'm also using an Ubuntu image, which is why I sort of have access to that bash as well. Feel free to stop me, ask questions if I'm, if I'm confusing anybody as well. Also, if you want me to explain what a readme is, I will. So don't tempt me. All right. So some of this look, could look for, confusing. I'm using a Docker file that's not important right now. Uh, what is important that, is that I wrote this in Ruby, and this is what it looks like. Um, you could write actions in whatever language that you want. I actually have an email with somebody who wrote an action in OCaml, 
which I'm super interested in. And uh, I just want to call out that I'm using the OctaKit library. Uh, OctaKit is a SDK for the GitHub API. It's something that I wish I knew about uh, five years ago when I rebuilt it from scratch, not knowingly, uh, at another company. So if you're interested, check out OctaKit if you want to interact in your project with GitHub. And then I'm checking to see, this is my check for invite. Dot invite has to be this. Uh, this is the way Ruby works and the way I want it to work. And then I'm doing very, very naive code where I'm just taking that, uh, the, the, the word that you put, uh, sorry, the phrase that you put in your, your comment, which is invite me, and then checking to see if it's me or a handle. Uh, I had this extra feature because some people have had issues and getting to work. So if I wanted to invite somebody else, I could just at mention your handle and pull that out. And uh, finally, I'm using, again, OctaKit to add someone to uh, the team. So everybody's been added to the, the one bucket team as well. So that's how, how that works. If you have any questions, please raise your hand, ask me to slow down. I'd be happy to explain anything else, even if I don't know the answer. So next thing is I want I wanted everybody to go through part 0 .a in the I don't know why my notifications are going crazy. Uh, I already see some people have already done this. So as I mentioned, uh, in part 0 .a, um, I did ask you to go through that. I also mentioned that there's going to be some merge conflicts because it's by the sheer nature of Git, you will be can't see what is sharing anymore. Zeta Bell's having issues seeing my screen. No? Uh, yeah, I guess my only uh, suggestion would be like a refresh. If not, I'm, I can sort of call out what I'm looking at at the moment too as well, which is the, the readme. And I'm going to call out that most people, or well, looks like seven, perhaps maybe 10 people went through part 0A, which is more of an exercise for myself. And uh, I asked people to open up an issue Sorry, open up a PR to add themselves to the attending that attendee.txt. Now these were all failed because they're going to be merge conflicts, but I did want to look at some that closed. Did any of them close? It's interesting that it failed, but still merged. So basically what I have is I have three more actions that I wanted to run. And actually, I'll look at a success. No, actually, that's none of them are successful. They've all failed. But they merged. All right, we'll try this one more time. All right, cool. So I have three actions running. Oh, yeah. And yeah, you'll have to resolve your own, own conflicts. Feel free to close it. Like, this is super trivial. Like, I, um, uh, I just wanted to showcase an action, so I just had everybody do it at the same time. And you can see that I have an action that sort of shows up once you've opened up the repo. Yeah, so basically what's happening is things are collapsing. Because um, if everybody's changing the same line number 5 or 12, and then you change number 12, it's going to not know what's happening, and it's going to fail. It's going to fail pretty miserably in the with the action workflow too, which I'll talk about failures and logs in a sec. Uh, but you can see that, um, Jake, if you didn't know that, that's a cool little feature. If you just hover over someone's name, you can see their, their actual full name instead of I am I Jambro. <laughs> it's a great name. Um, hopefully I said that right, though. Uh, so Jake actually opened a PR, which he's adding himself to the list. So you can see that. Uh, perhaps he had some merge conflicts because it looks like uh, maybe Jeff and him could collided together. But um Seems like the, regardless, I do want to go and look at what this uh, this action that ran. So the way I could do that is either click through here, or I, I just want to call out that the the existence of the actions tab as well, and then I should have probably clicked through Jake because I'm going to look at someone completely different. Um, but yeah, this actions tab is going to look at all my running actions, so you can see some other people are also attempting to, to work on this. This is probably not the best example. I should probably figure out a better example for people to get um, indoctrinated into actions. But you can see this action ran. Um, so two of the three actions actually ran. And I'll talk about that in a sec. So I've got this action, which is uh, auto approve. So any PR that opens, I want to auto approve. Like this, give me a thumbs up, a check mark. And then I have another action that labels the issue when it's approved. Uh, and the way that works is it adds a auto merge 
label. So it seems like everybody's sort of gotten that passing. And then what it really falls over, uh, which I, I have a feeling I know why, and it's because this action, sorry, actions are, for security reasons, they don't provide as much uh, um, access to the repo as we used to when I first started doing this workshop. But uh, rather than make, it, make assumptions, let me just go ahead and show this. And you can see I have a failure. Basis not exists. All right, actually, this is not even that. This is um, essentially, this is the conflict uh, where the, Everybody trying to merge at the same time on master, the the difference always changes. Um, so it's sort of a, it's just like a nice fun thing for me to show the team uh, back at GitHub and give them a nice uh, example of how we could perhaps improve improve the platform. Um, but I say all that because I wanted to to showcase that I have multiple actions running. So the feature itself is called GitHub Actions. But these GitHub Actions, the uh, combination of GitHub Actions are called workflows, which I've already I've already mentioned that term a couple times, and I'm like waving my hands to look at myself in the camera, but I realized that, um, actually, no, you can see both of me. Yeah, yeah, you see my screen and me. So I wasn't sure if I was sort of like explaining in my hands with, for no reason. Uh, but I do wanna show how this works. And we're just gonna ignore all the other open PRs. I'm gonna run a script and close those. Um, I have another workflow, which is called autoapprove.yaml, and I'll show you how that works. And again, all this is open source. So right now, like I'm working in the start here repo. Uh, but if you wanted to go at your own pace and look at this and read the content, like I'm ad-libbing the content because I've done this enough times. Um, so I might miss some stuff too. So reminder, feel free. Um, oh, that's a great question. And actually, I, I always forget about that. Um, you should be creating a pull request uh, to this. I don't think you have access rights to push the master. Correct me if I'm wrong if anybody's done that. Uh, but you should be opening a PR um, when you add yourself to the attendees. Oh, it did? Uh, uh, okay. Well, first thing you learn about open source is don't push the master. And uh, we all learn firsthand. That's what sort of is keeping us uh, out of sync at the moment too as well. Uh, that makes a lot of sense because if you push the master, which I'll walk through in a sec. Uh, but I wanted to call out. So I talked about, I didn't talk about this, but the name of my action is auto approve and merge. If I went to the actions log, you could see that name right here, auto approve and merge. Uh, you want to, I recommend naming your actions. Otherwise it's going to be called pull request. So it's going to default to something like that. Same thing with jobs, the jobs itself. Uh, I've added a custom ID, which is called build. Um, I could name this something better, but uh, at the moment it's called build. This should probably be called approve workflow or something. And it's gonna run on Ubuntu. So actions themselves, they are powered by YAML, but underlying technologies are VMs. The cool thing about this is that it gives you access to, to runtime, to run arbitrary code, as you saw with my inviting. I'm running arbitrary Ruby code to do stuff, stuff on GitHub. I don't have to run up a server or you know, open up my, my wallet and start paying for you know AWS credits to make this work. I'm able to get access to this just by having an, a repo in GitHub, which is a, another beauty of this. Inside of a job, we have this, this keyword called steps, and these are synchronous steps. So they have to go one after the other. So if you notice with uh, this auto approve action, it actually ran and then this one ran, but then this one failed. If this one failed, it would actually not let the auto merge one run at all. It would just skip it and then let you know there's a failure. So when you use the steps keyword, it runs synchronously. If I would just run instead of, so I have build, if I just made this uh, label and had a flag which is build that sort of lines up in the little tree of YAML, uh, it would run asynchronously. So the build would go and then the label would go. It doesn't matter who does it first, it just happens eventually. So this one I'll just call it that. The other thing is that, and this is all explained too in the readme, uh, I'm actually pointing to another GitHub repo. Uh, this is the other cool thing about this is that this is a, actually, I might be surprised, perhaps uh, Harry removed this. Okay, he didn't. So it still exists. So this is an auto approve action that's built by another one of my teammates at GitHub. And this is open sourced. All the code that powers this exists right here. Uh, and it looks like it's written in JavaScript. Oh, TypeScript, even better. So it's written in TypeScript, so it'll never break. Sorry, that's a, a jab. But um, 
Uh, it's written in TypeScript and it's using this library called Actions Core, um, which is Actions Core is also going to be uh, the Actions Toolkit too as well. Which at the time of me originally, the last time I gave this this talk, Actions Toolkit did not exist, so the content has not been updated to include that. So what I'm going to do is go here, Actions. I think it's spelled. Did they spell it wrong? I don't know. I'm not sure what happened. I'm going to pop that into the chat in case anybody wants to spend some time looking at that. If you're going to build an action today and you know JavaScript, I highly recommend uh, looking into Actions Toolkit. Uh, the toolkit itself, you start by installing Actions Core, and it gives you an SDK to interactive actions. All the actions I've done have been handwritten and powered by Docker containers, which is not the... It's a recommended way in the readme, especially if you're using other languages that are not supported in the toolkit. Um, but highly recommend doing the probably the, the path that's well tested, which is this way right here. Um, but Harry's he's essentially doing something very similar to what I was doing in Ruby, uh, but just doing a better using a better uh, pattern for it. Cool. Let me move down. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, so I'm running Actions Toolkit. But if you notice also, after the app, I'm running it on a very specific release tag. Now, if you haven't dealt with release tags, um, you probably have used projects or libraries that are cut uh, for releases. And what I mean by that is if you go to the releases section, so I'm on the readme, I've just zoomed into releases. You can see that Harry has, well, it looks like he's cut two releases. Am I running on 2.2? Oh, 2.0. Okay, I read that wrong. So he's got two different releases. Uh, the way to publish an action is you actually have to cut a release. So that way, no one gets a different version of the code. Um, so that's what I'm doing. He's cut a release, which means that at that time on September 11, 2019, maybe we never forget, uh, there's a version 2.0 that he cut, and that's the version I'm running on. There's also a version called 1.0. Uh, that I'm not running on, but if I wanted to for whatever reason, uh, there are some actions that I run old versions on because I just don't have time to update the code. Um, and if anybody, does anybody, um, should I explain Simver? Because I'm already here. So semantic versioning, the three different zeros, the first version is gonna be the code breaking release. So between one and two, something on the project changed that I need to either update my code to help use it. Uh, second number is gonna be the minor release which is not breaking changes, but maybe a feature was added. And then the last one's gonna be like a bug fix or a hot fix as well. So he's made drastic changes between February and September. Excellent. All right. And then finally, the one that, the action that's given me the most problem is this auto, or sorry, I didn't talk about label. So this is the label action. Um, this one I wanna point out that I'm running on master, um, which is, Essentially, um, when you walk into the repo for this project, I'm just saying whatever gets merged to master, I'm going to run into my code. This could potentially be dangerous. Uh, so I just wanted to point this out as well. Um, if you're going to run an action or if you're going to use code from NPM, like there's a reason why Like if you use Google Chrome, the version of Chrome that I'm using right now is Google Chrome Canary. So this is literally me, if me running Chrome on master. So what they do is every night they have a build when they make all the changes and they publish that to uh, to master. It gets deployed and then Brian uses it and gives an entire workshop on it or gives an entire workshop using that browser and hoping that nothing breaks. So that's literally what I'm doing. Uh, that's what I'm doing today in this workshop, but I'm also, that's what I'm doing uh, by doing this. But the reason why I'm actually pointing to master is because the cool thing about this is that Though I'm working on master, this is actually a fork. So another one of my coworkers actually built an action that was working fine for them. But I was like, you know what? This thing needs more features. So what I'm going to do, and like the way you would do open source, is I'm going to hit that fork button. I'm going to write a little code to make it work for myself. It's going to work. And then I'll push that back up to upstream and do a pull request and work on that. That's like hands down the biggest uh, value. And uh, it sounds like street sweepings happening outside. So you might be hearing that. The biggest value of GitHub Actions is that a lot of this code is open sourced. So if you're curious on how someone did something or you're curious of how the um, the Kubernetes team is running their entire infrastructure or running their automation to notify uh, special interest groups, leaders, 
on how to be notified whenever there's PR open. Like you can just go directly into a repo and look to see how that works. So if I went to GitHub Pandas, uh, Pandas Dev is a um, it's an org, and they're focused around machine learning. I'll address that real quick uh, in a sec, but. This is like a project that I don't know enough about. Um, I don't do any machine learning. I just know that machine learning is a thing that people do in their projects, but they're using this action that I've sort of lifted and put it in my project where they're actually, and if you open up issue and you want to assign yourself to an issue, you can't do it unless you're a part of the org. And the way they work around that is by using a, a GitHub action. And that's what this looks like here. Uh, we don't have to go into detail on how this works. Uh, we can talk about that later. But I just want to point, I wanted to point that out because you could fork a repo and you could take that code and then publish that as your own action. Like it is open source. If there's a license, like obviously you want to attribute their license or attribute the code to them. Uh, but this is MIT license, which means that it's all good to do whatever you want. Um, and you can click through it also. This isn't about licensing. There was actually a whole other talk that was earlier around open source licensing. Cool. Uh, the actions have list workflows that were triggered. How does this one look over actions as they've been configured for the repo? Independently or whether they've run? Triggered, how does one look at actions that they've been, that, that have been contributed? I'm assuming that's what that is. Um, yes. Let me finish real quick and I'll explain your, your hopefully I'll have an answer for you, the right answer for you. Um, the auto merge bot, same thing. Uh, this is another forked repo that I've published and onto a branch. So here I'm, I'm actually calling this action from master. I haven't even done a release. It's just actually uh, running any code that's on master right now, which is the only branch I have uh, because this is a fork. If I go to the auto merge action, which it seems like I do need some open source help on this one. Uh, I've actually mer I've actually forked this from uh, Pascal as well, and uh, I'm running it on this branch, which is called bot. And the way you can see that is by that flag right there, which is a branch name. So you run actions on commit shaws. So if you wanted to run it based on a commit rather than a, a branch, and when I say a commit shaw, I'm talking about this. This is quite speedy today. It means I gotta take a drink. Appreciate the question, Mitchell. Um, uh oh. Seems like uh, GitHub is having some load issues. Uh, but this is a commit shot right here. So you can see that this commit has a special number. If I wanted to run it on this, this version of the code at this time of day when it was pushed March 24th, I could actually do at that number as well. Excellent. So answering Mitchell's question, how do I know what actions have been triggered? Um, you could do one of two things. I can go to directly to the GitHub workflows folder and see if there are any actions installed on this project. Um, I've got a couple of different repos I could, I could walk through. Like I, I showed Pandas and their workflows. So they have two, one for CI and one for assigning issues. And then the way I could see what what actions have been triggered, looks like they're actively, looks like 11 minutes ago, they just pushed and they have a massive project. So this is gonna take a while, but um, you can see what they're working on. You see what actions are running. You also have a nice little filter over here. So if I wanted to see how many times someone actually has used this assign action, uh, you could see this was used 18 minutes ago as well as part of this, uh, this issue. Yep, the workforce folder is your source for true. Um, the actions experience team, I think is what they call themselves. Uh, they've been updating this this uh, place like pretty like frantically and like a lot. So I, I'd be surprised if this source of truth or the source of truth of the GitHub workflows folder won't eventually navigate here. So like right now you can see what's run but if you wanted to see and edit different workflow files, you could actually do that, uh, hopefully in the future from this page as well. Uh, other question, are actions triggered on events only or are they scheduled in cron-based triggers? That is a great question. And I don't cover until the very end of the section. So in case we run out of time, the answer is yes, you can do cron-based triggers. 
You can run actions based on GitHub, regular GitHub events as well. Um, all right, this is not my daily browser. Uh, GitHub help docs. Okay. But I, this is the browser I use to do presentations because it doesn't have my regular GitHub account. So that way you can see all the cool features we're shipping um, or the features we shipped last week. Um, GitHub Actions. So we're, I'm just looking at the GitHub help docs because I never remember anything. Uh, but in the help docs, is it events that trigger workflows as well. And I do realize, so this is a directory. And then you can see a list of different types of webhook events. So you can run them on checks. If you don't know what checks are, checks are things that you enable onto your repo. So like Travis CI, um, Circle. Um, there's a bunch of different checks that you can actually enable to do things with your code or repo. Uh, but the whole list of events, and I'll talk about a few of them coming up in a sec. Cool. So I have sort of gone off on a slight tangent because I haven't even got to part one of this tutorial, which I answer a lot of these questions too. So I'm going to power through the hello world because that's going to take you doing some action. Uh, that was not a pun, but no pun intended. But yeah, you're going to have to take some action uh, in the workshop. So what I want you to do is actually go to part one. Uh, so if you did not see in the readme, scroll all the way to the bottom to actually start part one. And then we'll start talking about events and triggers and more details of the, the YAML that is there for us. So, and then the first step I'll explain, uh, you do want to create a sandbox repository inside the org. So GitHub Craftwork is the org. You can also do this on your own repo, but um, it's going to be a lot easier for me to find if you have questions, if you do it in the org. It, really, it's your preference. Um, I had everybody do it in the org because we were all in the same room. I can see everybody sort of doing it. But I've also had the other problem where people will start using going to the workshop uh, when we don't have a workshop. Uh, so like, I just let people do whatever they want. Um, that's a new feature, and I'm glad you asked that. Um, include all branches. So are, we, are you forking the project? If you got an invite to the org, you should not have to fork. You should be able to create a repo directly in there. So for clarification, if you create a new sandbox repository by clicking this link, it should be into GitHub Craftwork and not um, <clears throat> not in like your personal org. Um, and that is because there is a, in the CI portion, publishing the NPM. Actually, there's, I forget what step it is. I apologize. There's one step that requires you to be in the org and not into your own repo. Um, the CI portion will be in your own repo. And then I'm, what it says is uh, create a template. So this is a feature uh, that came out uh, roughly three years ago, almost three years ago. Get out where you can create templates for your repos. And uh, I created a template which is called Hello World. Feel free to name it whatever you want. It's always going to be easier if you add your name to the name. So if you like Dougie Hello or that's, oh, it's available. I was going to say it's taken, but it's uh, it's available. So feel free to do that one. It'll be very confusing. And then uh, make it a public or private repo. I think I've enabled, this is on a free tier, but uh, probably make it a public so that way we anybody can see it. And then include all branches. Yeah. So this, so that, this is a new feature that came out like in the last three weeks where when you fork and create templates, you can include all branches. You only just need the default branch. So um, you don't really need to check it because everything that's on master is what you need. All the other branches are me testing and adding iterations to it that I haven't deleted. So uh, thanks for the question. But yeah, that's a, this is literally a feature that only shipped in the last three weeks. So that did not exist um, until recently. <clears throat> Excellent. So everybody take uh, some time to create your own repo. I'm going to take a breath and a drink of water as well as uh, put a cough drop in. I feel like when I talk too much, my throat gets a little scratchy, so I have to, uh, to eat a cough drop. Cool. And um, we start at 12, so we roughly have like an hour and 10 minutes too as well. So I think the pacing is actually pretty good right now. And uh, keep the questions coming too as well. There's um, 
even if they're off topic, like if you just have general GitHub questions, I'm happy to, I, I reserve the right to punt them until later, but if you have them, I'm happy to answer them. And if you have answered questions, ask questions. Oh yeah, actually there are questions up here. So while you're doing it, I'm gonna answer some questions that sort of popped in that I missed. Which I think, uh, and, uh, apologies, I knew your name. Last name Sakar, Sayak, Sayak. Um, what's the difference between actions and a CI? It appears to be pretty similar. Why not just call it CI if it's not that different? That's a great question. So the, the original time when I actually started doing this content, you could not do CI of actions. And what happened when we shipped this feature, it was really all around automation and developer automation, which is going to be part one and two of this workshop. Part three, we do do CI. So just spoiler alert, we will talk about CI. GitHub Actions, is, it's more than CI. So yes, you can run CI, you can run test uh, when you open a pull request. But what I didn't mention is there's some other stuff, clever things you can do. So I was already mentioned and asked about cron jobs, uh, cron-based triggers. So I have a GitHub Action that it lives. Uh, okay, here we go. It lives here. Uh, I have a repo where I test a bunch of stuff. Bot test repo. Excellent. So I have this repo and I, I test a bunch of stuff and I have an action. I might have deleted it. I did delete it. Anyway, I have an action that runs on a cron job. And I can just, uh, let me see. I'll just edit this one. So this is an action that I'm running on this folder. So I, it's this is my resize action that I was testing where I'm taking anything that gets added to this topics folder that's a PNG or a ping. I want to resize it to 288 by 288. This is like a common problem that I have in a lot of stuff like open source blogs and Jekyll blogs and stuff like that, where all the images are just kind of crazy and they come out all over the place at different sizes. So resizing every image that gets uploaded to a branch or a PR, super helpful. This is this would technically fall up when like the whole CI realm or part of the process of CI is great. Um, anytime a PR is open, I update the image. No one's the wiser, everybody's happy. The other cool thing is uh, cron jobs, which I have a cron job and I'll explain, but I wanted, I wanted to show how it works. So in this right tab, I, I hit the edit button. Uh, so this pencil here, if you didn't know, you can edit files directly in GitHub. Uh, so I hit that pencil right there. I'm editing the file uh, on this right bar. So this is my YAML on the right here. I've got some example actions that I could actually install on my project which is great. I'm not really, I don't wanna care about those right now, but you should definitely check those out. Over here, this actually documentation. So I sort of struggled through searching the documentation and finding it earlier, but you do have some basic documentation. But I wanted to call this out because I knew it existed right here. So one, the events that trigger workflows, it exists right here, if you wanted to find that out. But two, you have a cron job. So if I wanted to, instead of run this every time someone does a pull request, which I have right here, Perhaps I wanted to run this once a week or once every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So every weekday at 2 UTC, which is, uh, I have no idea what time that is. So if I wanted to do that, I could just run a cron job based on that. And the cool thing is that it helps you out a little bit and tells you that this is going to be every UTC at 9, 9 a.m. to UTC, which is, um, I think, where I'm at, I'm minus 7. So this is plus 9. So I guess it's like Australia. I don't know. I'm not sure where that time zone is. But anyway, that's how you do a cron job. So I can run this on that folder once a week, once a day, if I wanted to. So imagine you taking a bunch of work and processing images takes a lot of compute time. So rather than run that every single time someone opens a PR, you want to run it once a week. So that way you get all that compute time out of the way. This doesn't bog down the rest of the site. This doesn't bog down the rest of the queue for PRs getting merged. And you just do that like that. We have an action on my team because my team is remotely distributed. So I'm in California. But my my boss, my manager is actually in Ireland. And then my coworker is actually in Australia. I have another coworker who's on the other side of San Francisco. So like we're very rarely in the same room at all times. 
and we're also not in the same time zone. So instead of us go do stand-ups together every morning, we instead, once a week, we have an action that runs on Sundays because Australia, my Sunday is their Monday. Uh, I have an action that opens up an issue called Top 5, and we do our stand-up asynchronously in an issue. And then when in our team meeting on Tuesday, we sort of talk through, actually our team meeting is Mondays now, uh, we talk through all the stuff that's in there and then see if anybody needs help. And we drive our conversation in the issue during the week. <clears throat> so I hope that makes sense uh, as the question of like CI. We will talk about CI in a sec, but some of the stuff that doesn't really apply to continuous integration or continuous delivery, it really applies to if you zoom out and more of automation. So like continuous integration is actually getting your test to run every time you open a PR. Opening up an issue once a week on a Sunday is not really CI. And that's what I really meant by it's like it's more than CI. All right, so everybody should have opened up a, well, everybody who's participating should have opened up a PR to, okay, cool. So I'm gonna, I guess I, I keep picking on, um, I already forgot your first name. Uh, it doesn't work. Was it Jake? I already picked on Jake, but by sheer luck, Jake's been picked again. So Jake opened up the using the template Inside of GitHub Craftwork, he actually generated this from there as well. So you can see it's been generated from the Hello World template. Just wanted to call that out because template template WePros is something that not a lot of people use. So I just want to you know be an advocate and talk about the product. Um, by default, you get an action because of the template. You have an action here, so you have an action that's already run, and I'll talk about how that action works. So I'm gonna go back to the code. You have a GitHub folder. You have a workflows folder. You have a hello YAML, which you didn't write. I actually wrote it. So congratulations, you're using my code or using my YAML file. Not really much code. Um, this is the session for developer automation and tools. So I don't know which one you're looking for. Sorry, someone came through asking. So this is my session. Why am I blind? Can't see. Oh, no, not this one. Oh, this one. Yeah, so this is a session we're on here. Develop automation with GitHub Action. So hopefully that schedule will help you. Um, but yeah, going back to whoop, going back to here, um, we have a very simple action. OK. Yeah, it's also Eastern Standard Time. I'm sure it's helpful. I was super confused with time zones, and I've been struggling with time zones this entire workshop. So uh, trying to explain UTC plus nine. But let me t explain uh, Jake's action that he's inherited from me. So every time there's a push, so whenever someone pushes something through a repo, um, so it counts when you create a new repo, that is a push. You've pushed it to GitHub. Though you didn't go to the command line or on GitHub desktop or another tool like Tower, and push this to GitHub, it's created your initial push for you. A this also it's been inherited name, which is called a workflow from my Hello World action. It's got a jobs. This job is called build. I thought it said hello at one time, but I should really stop using the word build to name my actions because it's not very descriptive. But um it has a name called Hello World Actions. It's running on Ubuntu. If I wanted to, I could run this on Mac OS or Windows. There's also opportunities for you to self-host your own runners as well. So if you need something like ARM or something different to sort of test, like Actions is not only specific to web development. Uh, there are actions that are built in the CI platforms, including like Pandas, which I showed, which is machine learning. Uh, some of these things need to work on different environments. Um, there are some tools that I use that only are accessible through Homebrew on the Mac OS. Some tools that are only available on Windows. So depending on how you write code, you should be able to run your action that same sort of way. So when we start talking about CI, like you want to recreate that same environment that's on your local laptop or desktop in a GitHub action. So if you're going to run tests. But this one's super simple. It has one secret step. So I actually don't even need this steps, but it's there. And it's just echoing hello. And this, if you aren't familiar, this is like, this is using Bash. So the word echo is available to you because it's using Bash natively uh, in the... Linux VM. 
And the reason I say Linux, because Ubuntu is a Linux uh, distro. Um, apologies if I'm over explaining, but I just want to make sure if everybody's not on the same page, uh, at least we're all going to be at the same playing field, the same level. Oh, it looks like Jake's been working hard too. Um, you've already got your second PR up, but I want to show the first one. So keep keep at it. Uh, first one you would have solved is that as soon as you open up hello, there you go. And you see the word hello. So echo is omitted because the command is to basically echo that into the... Uh... <laughs> no problem, Jake. Uh, I, I'm, I'm still over explaining, so you got a huge head start. Um, but uh, basically what you see in the log is exactly what we expected, which is the word hello. Uh, next step that it seems like most people, maybe some people are still catching up. Feel free to catch up. Also, feel free if you got to bounce, uh, take care of kids or whatnot. All the stuff is available. This repo will never go away. Um, so uh, feel free to take this repo, share your share it with your friends. It's all there. It's also open source too as well. I'm just going to point that out. So if there's a spelling error, which I found, uh, despite the, how many times I've given this, I found spelling and grammar issues. I fixed before I um, actually did, I actually fixed yesterday of all times. But um, yeah, so if there's anything that's sort of that does not seem right, um, feel free to open a PR. I'm happy to, to merge that. Actually, what's going to happen is you open up the PR, it's going to auto merge because the actions I showed earlier uh, that are set up, it will auto merge and merge that in there. So please don't add random stuff or I will have to block you from the, the org. Um, cool. So the next step that Jake literally just did is that... Um, we have this idea since we're using bash we have the idea of having variables uh so if you want to use like the the dollar variable syntax uh we're going to set up an environment variable which will be your uh based on the instructions it should be your name um so we're going to test that out and i'm going to look at jake's stuff since i'm i've been already all up in his um his code already so update the hello and it should say hello jake or hello mary or whatever the name he said Hello, Jake. Good choice. Uh, so that's the next step. And the way that works is like this environment variable is another flag. Again, all this is going to be available to you in way more better context than I can do in the documentation. So if you're like, ah, I don't understand this or this context here, like open up a PR, explain this better, uh, or go to the documentation, uh, which I think is linked right here, uh, where you could actually uh, learn more about what is happening here. But basic stuff, we're just trying to... Um, add in a variable. What you're going to find out shortly after that when I explain is that you don't actually have to put your own name in there because every time an action is triggered, if it's triggered by me or by Jake opening a PR or by somebody else in the chat opening up a PR on a project, just going to have the concept of GitHub actor. And these will be anybody who's triggered that action. So this could be a bot or this could be you. And I'm going to Take a guess that the next one that I'm looking at is Jake making his update to, instead of switch that to uh, himself, it's going to switch to, oh, you haven't got, maybe I need to get ahead of you. But if you switch that that variable to GitHub Actor, it will be your name. So I'm going to take a break in case people are going to just finish and walk through the, the sections. Um, and I want to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I'm love, I would love to, even if they've been asked already, if I need to better explain something, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, so Mitchell, your question around uh, the user interface being a work in progress, always. This github.com is not a feature complete product. Like we're all constantly always iterating on it. If you saw what it looked like six months ago, you'd be shocked that anybody could actually get anything done with it. But... Some of our power users were super excited. They gave us a lot of good feedback when the when the product when the feature was in beta. GitHub Actions is no longer in beta, but at the time when I first started this project or started this workshop, it was in beta. So there was a lot of sort of cutting corners and explaining, over explain, even more explaining of how things work. Um, cool. I think we answered the uh, CI question. Yep. Yep. Branch question answered. Excellent. So part zero and part one were supposed to be super 
they're intentionally trivial. And it's mainly for me to be able to explain things like the jobs and the steps and the IDs that builds. Uh, I did also, I didn't, I realized I never explained, I never pointed out, but I did point out the name, a workflow for my GitHub action is actually labeled here. Another cool way to label the actual job that gets run, hello world action, that actually, actually being named here under the build as well. And then I have another name, which is the steps. So I've, I've intentionally spelled and did everything differently so you can actually see how that works. Because in the event that we had failures earlier, which I should go back to and we can talk about get up the logs in more detail, uh, it's gonna be much easier for you to figure out um, what's failed and when uh, by you adding names to things. So you can see that this hello world that I named here for the, the step that gets run uh, has that name that it's actually using right here. And the beauty of that, like this has no failures in it, but the beauty of that is that you can go and either search in the logs and find out what's wrong, or you can actually either download an archive of it. So if you want to zip and look into like a text file to see exactly what's wrong, what's wrong, because some of the projects that you're going to work on, it's going to have very long logs. And some of them like this one only has two lines. The other cool thing is that you can do view the raw logs. So instead of downloading it, you can actually just see the entire log right here as well. And this is, hello, Jake. But I did avoid the error messages as well. So let me uh, jump into one of these errors. And we can sort of, I'll probably explain, I'll probably remember exactly what's wrong Resource not accessible by integration. So let me see, was this a fork? Yes, it was a fork. Yeah, so I didn't explain this. I, I sort of skipped past this because I, I thought I knew the answer, but I, I moved forward because I was over, I was spending, I, I felt like I was spending too much time in the beginning, but this one failed because it's a fork. Um, and I, I, I actually, it's probably fine that I, I forgot to mention not to fork the repo to add yourself to the attendees.txt, but the, um, essentially like you editing a file directly and getting the approve requires it not to be a fork to get auto approved. Forks cannot be auto approved for security reasons. So you need extra, um, you need extra, um, what, do you, what am I trying to say? you need extra privileges and permissions to be able to edit a file based on a fork because I could, what I could potentially do is add this auto approve action to any project on GitHub and any project, oh, actually it actually opens up a, oh, a really good conversation around GitHub tokens. Any project on GitHub can have this action be added by a PR. And then I have an auto approve action that runs on the PR that auto approves and merges my PR. So imagine you being a me being a bad actor, like this would not be good. So for that reason, I didn't talk about this, but this GitHub token is what allows, it's given to you by default from GitHub and GitHub Actions, and it allows you to do some of this clever stuff in automation. The only issue with it, and the only issue we're finding here with forks is that this GitHub token by default does not give access to forks to do um, destructive things or merging PRs or editing files. The workaround for this, and I will not add this because then this project will get skipped really out of hand. If I uh, close some of these. The workaround for this is what I'm doing here, which is providing my own token, which I'll get to. Now, is it this one or is it this one? I do have an example. I definitely saw it earlier. What I think it is, is, oh, you know what it is? It's the invite to, uh, invite YAML. So you hear, see here that I'm actually not using the GitHub token, though it's provided to me to default, because I can't, the base layer of permissions for GitHub Actions does not allow you to invite people to your org. 
what I had to do is actually create a token. I do explain in the documentation, but I will go through, explain this so that way everybody gets the context and sort of commits that to memory uh, if you'd like. Uh, in the settings, so I just went to my profile, went to settings. There's a section called developer settings. Here you can create a custom token. Uh, and again, this is my side project app. Um, I can create a, a custom token that has adds permissions for organizations. And then with that permission, I have to add access to the org and admin. So this is the permission that will give me access to invite people to a repo. If you wanted to give someone access to write repo deployment, actually, Full control or repository. Oh, well, which one is it? Anyway, it's one of these. I think it's the first one. Maybe this is inclusive. Read, read write access to the, the repo. Well, that's private repos. Oh, no, actually, it's just, it's just the first one, which uh, I'm noticing my uh, trackpad just died. So let me plug that in. Funny enough, I did not get a notification that the battery is low. All right, so I'm back. All right, so this is the one that would give me access to be able to let you create forks on the end, end attendees.txt. Um, so that way anybody can open a, a fork and merge it there. But I I remember I actually discovered this bug, it wasn't a bug, I discovered this limitation earlier in the life cycle of the feature for actions, and then I I ended up uh, kicking off a whole discussion on forks, and it's a, it's a discussion that happens all the time. Um, been using the custom token to work the sprint review dashboard. Thank you so much for making it. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so yeah, you definitely want to, if you're going to do something a little more extensive or, well, better access, you want to create another token. I didn't explain to you as well. So I have a BDuggy token. And this is intentionally, I've named this because I want to make sure it sort of hammers home that this is not the token that GitHub gives you. Uh, the way to, uh, I just realized I'm on the wrong browser to be able to show this. So let me switch to my other account, GitHub Craftwork. So the way to add that token, the way I did it, um, I'm logged into my other account too as well. Um, so. If you see anything sensitive, please take a screenshot and post it on Hacker News. Just kidding. Um, yeah, so I went to settings for the repo. Um, actually, settings here on this tab. And then I went to secrets. Or oh, I haven't gone there. But you can see I've added a secret. So that token that I would have created in the other browser, uh, I can add and say this is a 101 token if I wanted to. And... Let's do a, a nice long token. I'm sure that will work. And then I could actually just leverage, uh, fill that secret name. So the name's invalid. I was actually curious if that would work. So it actually has to be one on, it doesn't take numbers. And I think that's a, a limitation. Excellent. Also, shout out to my mechanical keyboard. I don't know why this error message, okay, this added, but my error message never went away. Looks like I have an issue for my team to look at. Why is my issue not clearing? All right. You see how I do my job live. I, I'm going to go open an issue in the engineering org and tell them. Um, cool. So yeah, if I wanted to, I could switch that token. Instead of BDuggy token, I could switch to 101. Because I just made up that that uh, key, it's not going to work. So I won't even do that because it would just be silly. Uh, but I can, just, again, change this to be a 101 token. And then everywhere where GitHub Actions thinks that there's a GitHub token, it just hot replaces this. These environment variables are actually super useful, and we'll get to that in the CI section. Actually, on the, based on the time, I'm not sure how if we're going to get to the NPM deploying, which is fine because that, that process has changed, and I wasn't confident that it would still work the way I wrote it. Um, I wrote it a way that did not that when we did not have the feature existed. Also, ironically, we did not own NPM as well. Um, so you're actually working on a way to make this a uh, more integrated process. So probably not worth really going through that section because that's going to change really soon. Um, so yeah, that's how you would do a custom token if you have CI or even have a service or let's say you're not doing CI, 
with actions, but you can CI with Travis or Circle, and you want to integrate that with actions really closely, um, you can do that by just adding an environment token and then running your action the way you would want it. Uh, you can use the account containers to make it log in a different. Uh, yeah. You know, I used to have that set up, but um, and I, I think the the question the thing is that you can um, add another person here. Uh, it's what you're sort of referencing, uh, Ethan. I do that, but um, I also just love having the separate browsers, and it reminds me to open up Canary and see what's broken. Because when I browse a lot of, I do a lot of like React and JavaScript stuff, and I always find issues in my approach. So I always try to use like Safari and Firefox in the Canary version of Chrome for that reason. But um, yeah, definitely good. I should probably set that up anyway. Um, it, it only takes like a few seconds to do. Yeah. And then now we're contemplating on the, the GitHub error that we all saw too as well. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a, it is a thing. Uh, it is a thing that I find because where it's a Ruby on Rails app, which is github.com. And they use uh, TurboLinks. And I find that I've never been a fan of TurboLinks because I prefer to use like a client-side JavaScript thing to do that. Um, but sometimes you find that you have to hard refresh to get updates uh, on the site. And I think that was uh, the inverse. But I'm happy to talk about that with the team. Yeah, GitHub's made by, it's all Ruby on Rails and very light JavaScript. We actually had a, uh, Apologies. Uh, let's just talk about this real quick. Uh, we actually removed all the jQuery from the site. So GitHub has been around since 2000, end of 2007. No, April 2008. Yeah, April 2008 is when it started. And it's GitHub log jQuery. But when I first joined, we actually did a little project where we moved all the jQuery from the site. So now what you're looking at is very simplistic JavaScript and a lot of complicated Ruby on Rails built a bunch of other frameworks like which not just like we're a large large project so <laughs> true no comment um yeah but it's we're a large project so obviously it's not just ruby on rails like we do have like go and java and other services that power what you see on the page um but we um we have a lot of like um yeah we just have a lot of infrastructure like we're, we're very a lot, of, uh, a lot of users. All right, so I, I've gone on a very meandering tangent. Hopefully all this has been helpful. Uh, again, like all this content could be done uh, asynchronously on your own pace, uh, but I did want to go ahead and explain and as questions come up, like you do have me as a resource if you want more details of like GitHub and GitHub Actions. So hopefully you've gotten that. I did realize that there, we did talk about the difference between CI and Actions, which it's not really a difference because you do CI with actions, which we'll talk about. Um, but we didn't talk about GitHub apps too as well. And I realized we didn't cover that. Um, but what I want to do is introduce part two. And then while part two is being done, I can explain GitHub apps as well. So you can like listen and then essentially copy and paste is what you're going to be doing. So, and none of this, yeah, none of this is going to be um, any heavy coding. I didn't really say that upfront too. I know we had one person asking about it being beginner friendly. Um, but yeah, the whole time while we're in here, we're just gonna be copy and pasting as well as you're more than welcome to uh, just continue like looking at the, listening to me talk and looking at my my pictures that my wife took. Actually, this is, that's me. That was me uh, 10 years ago. No, yeah, 10 years ago. My wife takes pictures with that camera. Ironically. All right, cool. Um, oh yeah, introduction. <laughs> Man, tangents. All right, so what I want you to do is read through as I as I also talk. I'll give you a break to, you can listen, and, or so you can read without me talking in your ear. But uh, I want you to go ahead and add this entire YAML file to the same project we just opened. So that Hello World project, add this YAML file. Uh, it should be like mad, madlib.yaml, if that's not clear. Uh, and it should be in your github.workflows uh, folder. So give me a thumbs up if you can hear that trumpet outside. I have a very, I'm on a very busy street in Oakland. Um, so we get, like we just had street sweeping earlier. Uh, now we have trumpet right outside my door. 
Um, so it's like, it's awesome background music while you're coding for sure. Um, yeah, so anyway, go into your whole world, your repo, copy and paste this YAML file. And then from there, we will, uh, we will proceed. And then I will give you 60 seconds of me not talking. So that way you can concentrate on copy and pasting. And then I'll explain GitHub apps and GitHub actions in a moment. Cool. So that should at least give you a head start on the copy and pasting. Um, also, I realize I have a uh, a note about Wi-Fi, but we're not in the same room. So, hmm, what was I going to say? Oh, GitHub Actions and GitHub Apps. So, I preface this conversation, this workshop, with how GitHub was working on a bunch of different primitives. This primitive, this whole like primitive workflow and tour through like building a better API, building a better authentication layer with JWTs, building better interactions with webhooks, like all those combinations into workflow automation was originally like slated for GitHub apps. And then what we found was like a lot of people want to use GitHub apps because they want to have tight integration and automation onto their repos and their companies. But then sometimes people just want to do something super trivial, like a hello world, or uh, what you're working on with the Mad Lib. Like that does not. That, what happens with GitHub apps is you have to bring your own infrastructure, and you have to host your own servers to make your GitHub apps work. Now you can definitely use like serverless functions to power everything, but then that's that bar of entry to automate things in your workflow was just super hefty and took a lot of work. So GitHub apps still exist. And it's still a great way for you to automate your, your projects, especially if you work in like an enterprise, GitHub Enterprise or something different, or a whole another platform like uh, GitLab or Bitbucket. Like those are all really great paths to do automation in your workflows. But with GitHub Actions, uh, everything's given to you by default. So all you have to know is how to do YAML flags and to also follow good instructions when you have notes about let me close some of these tabs. Notes about um, too many tabs, too many tabs. Excellent. So when you have a note about like something not working, the other cool thing is that actions. So I've, I already have an, a YAML file, but if I wanted to, let's say instead of edited. All right, well, maybe I'm wrong. That used to autocomplete. Well, I guess what they do do is give you um, errors if you have things like this, extra tabs. But it used to give you a, um, why am I uh, thinking? Oh, I know what it will do. Let me delete that. I wanted to switch this to, oh, maybe they got rid of that. Maybe it was too buggy. All right, well, we used to have like auto completion on YAML file when you edit it, but Apparently, we don't have it anymore. So I should probably ask about that before I start preaching about it. So apologies, you, you're, seeing, you're seeing me sort of uh, flounder at this point. Forget I even said that. But what I'm saying is that you, all you have to do is just copy and paste someone else's YAML file, and you have automation. Previously with GitHub apps and currently with GitHub apps, it takes a little more effort if you want to copy somebody else that, uh, oh, you haven't? Oh, you know, maybe it's the uh, Canary version. That's why it's good to use untested version of the browser. Uh, anyway, like uh, Mike has it. So everybody everybody asked Mike how that works. Um, anyway, it's not, a, hopefully you guys understand what auto completion. I have to go through and create a whole nother um, edit file on another browser. But what I was getting it, uh, is that a claim? Yeah. Um, 
yeah, so I'm not sure what's happening there. But uh, what I'm getting at is they um, actions is like a lower bar of entry to to do things uh, is what we have with GitHub Actions. And the cool thing about it is that it's also powering a lot of other things. So I think it's not on this browser. We have this thing, which is github.com slash code spaces. I don't know if everybody heard about this feature that we shipped last week. Oh, you know what it is? I have to turn on my staff tools. So this is a this is great that this is being recorded, but uh, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to talk about. But it's a public feature that I've been love. I've really wanted to talk about for the longest time, which is called Code Spaces. And what this is is you get a let me just go into this one. You get an entire environment to write code directly in the browser on GitHub. And the way this is working is actually powered by actions. So we're actually leveraging our feature to sort of do a hot swapping and getting stuff to work. Now this is a, this is a super, I guess it's not alpha. It was alpha up until last week. It's a limited beta. So it is a bit of a resource hog at the moment. They're actually working on that. And then we'll open up even, even broader. That's probably the part I wasn't supposed to say out loud. But yeah, so now you can see it's setting up my project so I can actually edit my code directly in the browser. Super excited about this. Uh, while that's working, uh, the shout out that you can sign up for the beta here. And I guess we'll start hopefully adding people in uh, closer towards the end of the month. But yeah, that's what this is, code spaces. And that's exactly what my page looks like, loading. Here we are, here's my code. But yeah, what I was getting at is that's powered by GitHub Actions. Well, parts of it, it is. All right. So I've been rambling and talking because I was trying to give you time to work on this Mad Lib issue. So the way I'm going to do this, and the reason why I, did, I have everybody do it in the craft work as well, which is another example. It looks like someone's a... Uh, actually, that's mine. Let's see. It should... The way it works, it should be the last thing that someone updated. I could actually see it. So the reason why I have everybody doing the workflow, or sorry, in the same org, is it's easier for me to sort of pick on some people updating things. And I think part 2A, thank you, Glitch Girl. Finally not picking on uh, Jake. Uh, yeah, so you, you did a great job copying and pasting, and that's exactly what I needed. Um, so that's the first step. The next step would be just be opening up an issue. And uh, I want to, I'm curious, anybody, has anybody opened up an issue yet? Maybe just pop in your handle, um, I can find it. Excellent, thank you very much for volunteering. I realized as I was going to people's uh, repos, I probably should just ask for it instead of uh, put people on blast too as well. So apologies for Jake and uh, Glitch Girl, uh, if that was uncomfortable, uh, that was not my intention. All right. <laughs> All right, so I have a <laughs> yeah. So this is a little, this is a GitHub action that I wrote myself uh, back when I was testing GitHub actions and sort of I think what a lot of people did is they went straight to CI and I was like, hold on, let me try to uh, let me try to build something that's outside of the box uh, in the realm of what people are thinking. And there's a reason why I built this this action too as well because I use it in production uh, for one of my projects at GitHub. Um, so this is a Madlib. If you are not familiar with Mad Libs. Uh, these are like little, it's like back when I was a kid, you get this little book when you go on a, like a long drive with your parents to a vacation or something or to your grandma's house. And you fill in, they tell you, give me a noun, give me an adjective, give me a verb. And just give me that. And then from there, it'll create, I'll construct a, a, a story or a sentence. So um, today, today I was at the, this is what we, the result we got. Today I saw a moldy, I guess we didn't get a noun. I guess a noun broke. A moldy adjective, uh, flurkin, jumping down in its tree. He went quickly through the large tunnel to his big table. So yeah, basically he just gets this non, like sometimes they don't make any sense. At first I thought I broke it and then I noticed the action updates. Yes. Ups and tokens actually issue is great. Cool. Yeah, so by copying and pasting the action into your repo, you automatically get this by you get the, it the trigger. Sorry, you don't even get a trigger. So we're actually running it on issues. So whenever the issue is opened, um, which I'm surprised this worked too, because this is an older syntax. Like it should be, 
it should actually look like this. And if I update it, if I thought about it, I would update it to be this instead. So instead of it should be opened, something like that. But uh, if I think about it, I'll, I'll update the uh, the template. But anyway, right now it opens any closed issue, opened issue, any edited issue. It's going to run regardless because we don't have any type of type flag on here. Um, which again, the documentation will explain that better than I'm doing right now. So I'm going to just bounce out of that. Uh, but we are creating a new workflow that's running on Ubuntu uh, for no reason. We're also using another action, which I'm going to make a call out to that is existence, which is really leverage for CI. Uh, also, another thing that I wasn't sure about when I first wrote this example was this action will check out master. So it's actually better to, uh, when you're doing CI, if you're going to run a pull request and check the test, you want to check it on master because master is usually the branch that people work on. Your main branch could be main branch. It could be development. It could be production. It could be re released. Um, but it's just going to check out whatever branch you provide it to. I'm running this on master too, because at the time that was the only one release that existed, but we're up to V2 now. So I highly recommend you use V2 because V2, you can actually pass in the branch that you're looking for. So I say all that because I, we are to power this, we're using my action, which is called variables and markdown. Uh, and the way that works is when you first open your issue, and this is me just testing out. Like, there's probably a better way to do this. So, again, variables and markdown is open source. But I'm opening an issue on um, your your repo, and you add a, a bunch of. Oh, it looks like I, I did provide some. I think I provided the variables to you by default too, as well. You can just update them. Um, but I made I did that because I also did not want the barrier of entry to know what grammar and types of words were. Uh, so I think that's why I did that too, as well, because I didn't want to have. I'm not great. I'm not great at, at English, so I just sort of just uh, uh, cool. Good catch. Yeah, I'm not great at English, so I don't want to explain what a verb and a noun was. I just wanted to give that to you for free. Um, but what I'm saying is that these little handlebars that are inside the project, I have a project that basically just finds adjective one and then replaces that. Hot replaces that, and the the first thing you see is that all these things have not been changed, and the way this works is that the action gets run and it runs my variables and markdown uh, action, which is powered by another project, which I also open source is called Marky Markdown. Mm -hmm. And it changes out those, those uh, variables and replaces it. So you can see variables markdowns running, version 0 0.4. Also, it's going to point out to you as well, just to hammer the point home, that this is all open source stuff that it's built on. Feel free to bring, build your own or use mine. Probably build your own because mine's not great. Um, but variables and markdown is my this is my repo I've built, and you can see my explaining on how it works. You can see that um, my example, which is the noun, which is mother, Mark Wahlberg attribution, say hi to your mother. Um, that's the phrase that it gets said. This is nothing but some simple Ruby code, and like I'm not the best Ruby developer, but at the time I wanted to write more Ruby because I had not write, written Ruby in like two years. So that's why all these examples are in Ruby. I uh, actually write ton, a ton more JavaScript. Uh, but you can see here that this action, the code that powers this action, you can actually read and clearly see what's going on. Uh, if it isn't clear, I do have some comments too to help with that. And if there's any, if anybody else is just not really confused on how this works, um, I'm happy to explain it too as well. I had a whole conference talk that got canceled that was gonna explain Marky Markdown in Transformer which was a pun. I say all that because I wanted to show you my pun that I wrote, which is the, the Marky Markdown actually transforms the transformer. It's a Mark Wahlberg joke. Um, sorry if that sort of uh, did not land. All right, so I say all that because by the time I come back here, you can see all my, the comment was updated by the GitHub action spot right here, and no one else did that. Except the bots. The bots are here. Transformers. Sounds like it's Transformer. All right. Sorry, these are bad jokes. You'd probably be hitting much better and if I was in a room and I could hear you laughing. Yeah, that, that's that's how I that's how I roll. It's like strong dad jokes that just don't ever give up. All right. Um, 
yeah, so that's how that works. And uh, any questions on variables on Markdown, I'm happy to answer them in the issues. If it doesn't work, I'm happy to look into why it doesn't work. And let's move on into part three. So part three is going to be, if you didn't look ahead, part three is our last part. And we do have roughly, what, 25 minutes, 26 minutes left. So let me go into, just want to point out to you as well, uh, the workshop folder is where all the parts are. We just completed part three. Uh, sorry, part two. We're going to part three. Part four is this bonus where we just sort of talk through, which I think at this point, a lot of this is going to be self-explanatory because it is copy and pasting and clicking buttons. Um, but what I want you to do is go to the C, uh, this template right here using the, actually, yeah, there we go. Yeah, if you click that link, you should be able to create a CI template. So that's the next part if you haven't got there yet. So click that link, create a CI template, make sure you're in the org. Uh, it's just going to be a lot easier for me to find it later. Uh, if you don't want to do it in the org, like in the org, it's fine. Take it home, homework. Oh, good catch. So Roberto actually points out some really good uh, details and something I, for some reason, I did not get to that. Um, but again, I, I wrote this original tutorial back in the last time I gave this tutorial was in October, the end of October. We've had new versions. Okay, sounds good. Um, we've had new versions. So feel free to, if you do get stuck, there the, the actual code that you're looking at might look different. Uh, one of the biggest differences is the way we use the environment variables in with in node versions. Uh, I believe that's changed. Uh, actually, I'll just wa I'll walk through it myself uh, along with everybody, and then we can catch anything because we only have yeah roughly 15 minutes, and then uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to. Um, start asking questions, anything I can sort of cover while you have me. I um, also do want to point out to you as well, in case we do hit time, uh, on BWE on GitHub and BWO on Twitter as well, which I'll share that again once I'm done. Uh, just trying it out. Let's feel free to go along, follow along with me or just watch me do it. But I'm going to create a template, which is based on the CI. Uh, the next step that it's going to want you to do is pick a Node.js template, starter template. Um, I will address those security vulnerabilities sometime. Uh, definitely pay attention to these things. Like, uh, don't use this in production. Don't use my example in production because obviously you can see there's some high severity security vulnerabilities, but I have no bandwidth to fix it. So I'm gonna mark those closed. Uh, you can go to the Actions tab, which is the next step it's going to tell you. And then you want to set up a Node.js workflow, which I do want to point out too. Uh, it knows like, it knows that there's JavaScript in here, and mainly it's because there's a package.json in there. If this was a .NET Core um, project, this suggested section should say something .NET Core. Um, and then I also want to point out, there are some other actions that you can sort of get your feet wet with as well. So some of the other trivial things like Stalebot and Labeler and greetings, like saying hello when someone opens an issue for the first time in your project, that's all uh, some suggestions that you could use um, as well. But for now, we're going to focus on the CI section. Now, I wonder what is change? Yeah, so one thing that has changed is that there's a version one of setup node. So I think before I might have been working off master. No, it actually is still version one. Um, I don't know what um, who is it, Roberto? Parse three eighty nine just for your version in the workshop. Oh, is it the node version? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what actually has changed. The only difference is that I can see is that we're not using eight dot x because I think. That X is actually fallen out of support. Oh, it's V2? Oh, interesting. Oh, well, well, click the button and see what happens. Like, this is a copy and paste workshop. So I copy and paste and we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna merge that to directly the master. I could do a PR, um, but no reason. 
Looks like I already have pull requests to help me with those versions that fall out of favor. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it mine just has push. Pull request is the second event that actually I did go ahead and accept and keep. Um, I forgot. I was talking to the team about this, and they originally only wanted push because they wanted other people to just uh, to find out the, the workflows they wanted. Um, also, some people complain because sometimes push... Actually, I think we, we fixed that because push and pull request are running both at the same time. So every time you open a pull request, you get two actions running. And since now we're actually charging, uh, you get 3,000 minutes for free. Actually, we haven't made that announcement, did we? At the end of the month, we're going to actually have a hard cap on how many limits, how many minutes you have on actions, which is 3,000 minutes. I think at the moment, we don't have a limit for open source, but we sort of figured out through the beta, uh, whatever the limit is. That's a good question, Barry. Um, and I was that part four is that. So... What I'll do is actually to show off the CI, and what I'll do is also tr talk through um, the rest of the stuff. Uh, end of the month, Ethan. But the earlier the question, and the, the reason why I do CI at the end is because it's point and click, and then it works. So I just added CI, and now I have my test running for node 10.x and node 12. Uh, both on separate, separate actions. And let me explain that too as well. Um, let me explain that in the workflow. So some of the stuff I was, I was calling out in the chat, but I, I wasn't actually looking at it. So in case people are not kind of disjointed from what I'm saying and what's on the screen, what I was talking about is that uh, my example only has push and it's only pushing the branch master, uh, which doesn't make a huge difference um, because I don't think I'm calling out the branch either, but I only want to have the action run and it's only filtering on this branch. I could do a comma and then add like bot branch, development branch, whatever branch, and make it sure it runs on those branches, but I only want it to run then. The other thing I'm going to do is only run on pull requests on master. So sometimes you run a, um, yeah, sometimes you want to run a pull request on, and the reason, uh, actually, I'm going to answer that in a sec. Sometimes you want to run uh, your CI only on pull requests. Sometimes you want to run on multiple branches because uh, you maybe have a staging or a long, long time release. Um, so that's where you sort of add these filters. And we didn't really cover any of this uh, previously, other than the fact that I was also showing issues opened in the previous section. It is pretty wordy because this is where I get the most questions at. But also, this is like the section that takes less time to run through. So it is literally copying and pasting. Um, so this has been, uh, I've already explained, you could run different versions, so Mac OS and, and uh, Windows. The strategy is where you would do the things like your matrix builds. So if you want to run every single version, yeah, 3,000 minutes per month. Yes, correct. Uh, if you want to run every single version, and you get more minutes if you pay, if you're a paid user as well. Um, but if you want to run every single version of Node, I think earliest, by default, the earliest I think we have, which there's like an open community issue, is like something in the th Node 3 version. And it's not because we don't respect older versions of Node, it's because we haven't had a need to add other versions of Node until very recently. No one's asked for them. Um, but I'm also going to call out too as well, GitHub community form. A lot of the actions teams and the PMs, they hang out in the form. So if you have specific questions on your use case or minutes and what it looks like, feel free to ask a question here or find the answer as well. So obviously the, maybe, sorry, I shouldn't say obviously, but the green check marks is what have been answered questions. Um, so if you happen to find something, so there's a specific question on self-hosted runners, which I will not cover, um, you can find it there. Let's go back to my here. Um, call out that I'm using V2. So previously I was using, I was only using master, which is still V2, and then some, uh, which could be dangerous, and then the, the canary thing. I'm using an environment variable to grab the matrix in the version. This strategy flag is you can do some creative and clever things on strategy, like running specific Docker containers for just that one action. Uh, so you can do other clever things like that, which I've experimented with, but don't really have any good examples of when you would use that. 
My only example is I have a Ruby on Rails project that I can't share that has to run on a specific version of Postgres. So I'm doing some clever things with that. Um, but the documentation in the form will help you if you have a something specific to your use case. I'd also highly recommend that if you want to go to the open source repo and check that out, uh, some open source repos do have some clever ways to do uh, to run actions. Uh, one that I every time I open up this, it doesn't actually open. Doesn't actually go to my uh, Omni bar up there. I want to say, oh, it looks like they're not using any. Clever. Unless they're, I've been talking to Wesley from the ExpressJS team, so I thought that they would head at some actions because I talked about actions all the time. Um, the other person, the other project, perhaps Babel, has an actions folder. So if you just want to see like another project that you could actually just look up their actions too as well, um, which are all open source. So Babel has a bunch of actions where they, so I showed you how to do an action by pointing to in the folder directory. Um, you can also do an action by using a third-party action. Um, but Babel is actually using actions by putting them in a specific folder and then running it from there. So very similar to the way you would approach like doing, uh, well, by using Babel, they actually shove everything in folders as well. Um, I also failed to mention GitHub Marketplace too as well. So I just want to give a quick call out. The fact that you can find other actions. Oh, I did mention it, but I mentioned it briefly uh, in the context of the docs tab. So if you want to find other actions, apologies, I like I had, I had a ton of time that I could have finished with and I like went on tangent and forgot to finish. Um, but there's like 3,500 actions. We've had 100 actions since last week because I had this page up last week last Wednesday, and we've got 100 new actions since then. But if you want to find an action specific to use case or maybe someone's built, also check there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I don't, yeah, if you're familiar with NPM, uh, this will look familiar. If you aren't, um, apologies, I don't have time to explain how NPM works. But um, this is basically building your project. If you do have a build command, that's what this if present flag is. And then it's running NPM tests. and this is actually built in the npm the project not built in action so everywhere you see a run flag or sorry, a run task you're running that in bash because bash has an ubuntu i believe in windows it might still be still bash but don't quote me on that because i don't use a lot of windows so i sell that and uh i will wrap up because all this content is available to you uh available through this. This is pretty long-winded. It sort of walks through CI template. Some people have caught uh, some older content here. So please uh, open up PR if you have places we can improve this. Uh, I do walk into, like right now, there's no test in your project. So you can copy and paste your test. You can then mess around with the build. So we do have a, a build that works. Uh, so if you want to have a build, build version of your project into a disk uh, dis folder, it also works. We also use another action from Marketplace, which I would explain if I had more time, which is formatting your node code. So imagine that everybody writes their node code with either single or double quotes. Um, you could actually have a formatter tool to see is prettier to enforce the single formatting. And what it does is actually the action itself, just like we have seen so far, it commits directly to your PR for you, which is great if you have a project that you still want to explain the benefits of single quotes versus double quotes. If there is, I'm not sure if there's actually benefits for that. Another one, which is going to answer your question, my my favorite action, which is auto uh, publisher release. This actually writes drafts up releases for you, which look like this, uh, without you needing to do it yourself. So every time you push a project, uh, you merge a project in the master, and you cut a release, everything that's pushed in master since the last release will be auto added to a draft uh, release. And that sort of explains that. And then finally, publish an NPM, which is going to change in the future. Uh, but if you want to do it like in a very naive way that I did, um, you can copy and paste and do it that way too as well. So thank you very much. Again, the content's available at this org. Feel free to share it with your friends or take some time, uh, if you have some time uh, later in the week, uh, to go through the rest of it that we didn't go through. And uh, I am, uh, yeah, I'm happy everybody got some good content from it. I ironically, Microsoft Build is happening at the same time, and they um, they had me pre-record this talk, so I'm actually giving this talk at the same time at Microsoft Build, which is kind of wild. 
um, that that's happening. But don't tell Microsoft I'm doing this here for free without you needing to pay. Actually, I think that conference is free anyway. Yeah, pleasure. And then I'm going to throw this up here and I will chat until, actually, Nancy, I don't know if is the end time, is it 10 minutes till? Or are we stop at the top of the hour? I forget. Excellent. I appreciate uh, everybody getting so much out of this, and I appreciate you you being here. Appreciate everybody. Uh, this event is super awesome. I sat through some talks this morning. I will say some 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 of the closing words later. Uh, I'm a big fan of open source, and I, I love having opportunity for people to build things to have an introduction. So if you have an action that you would like to share, please open source it. Um, I did not mention this actions hackathon we did last month, but essentially there's a bunch of other actions that people built like yourselves that just threw those out there. Uh, so definitely not for the purpose of participating in the hackathon because it's over, but if you're looking for more actions that are not on Marketplace, um, highly recommend check, checking out that if you want to sort of expand your brain on ways you can improve your developer workflow. Cool. Jake, thanks for your code. Thanks for being a, a good sport. Mm. Sayak, Sayak, Sartar, Sarkar. Um, apologies on mispronouncing your name once again, um, but also a very, very appreciative of you being here and also sharing and volunteering as well. Excellent. All right, that is it. I'm going to stop sharing. I will sit here and look awkwardly. So 20 people who are listening to me. Just kidding. All right, I will I will cut, kill the my video and uh, again, see you later.